What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. What's up, everybody? Let's get into another very interesting organized crime discussion. And in terms of organized crime history, Frank Costello is regarded as the most politically connected mobster of all time. His ability to have sway over political entity as well as labor racketeering led him to be one of the most successful people in the history of the mafia. But there are other very integral labor racketeers and politically connected individuals. One of them we're going to get into today. The story of the very little talked about Anthony Scotto next on the sit down. Anthony Scotto was born May 10th, 1934 in Brooklyn, New York. Now, the young Scotto was the son of a sanitation worker who would ultimately become a big union organizer, like father, like son for Anthony Scotto. Scotto would grow up in Carroll Gardens and Red Hook, and it was said that the Scottos were mainstays in the area of Court Street in Brooklyn. If you know anything about Carroll Gardens and Red Hook, Court Street has a rich history in mafia history. Scotto had two things that he was destined to be. A labor racketeer, a leader, well, actually three things. A labor racketeer, a leader, and most notably, probably a gangster. But Scotto has one of the more interesting tracks in the mafia, one of which we don't see very much. The young Anthony Scotto was a labor racketeer in his blood. He would become a longshoreman by the age of 16, and his future was likely decided for him. But that wouldn't stop him from having other interests and learning a bunch of other things that would help him down the road in life. The word leader comes to mind when I think of Anthony Scotto. Scotto would ultimately graduate in the early 50s from St. Francis Prep School for Boys in Brooklyn. And he would, for one point, upon his graduation from high school, enroll at the very interesting Brooklyn College. Now, it was said that there was one thing about Scotto you could always find. He was always someone in collection of political science books. He really enjoyed politics. He liked philosophy. He was a thinker, but he always knew the connections, people you knew. I always say that's the most important thing in life. And for someone like Anthony Scotto, he agreed with that. And we're going to talk about his deep political connections as well. But his early schooling at Brooklyn College before his dropout in the mid 50s, I think would really be important to him down the road. But Anthony Scotto was born to be a longshoreman. He was also born to be an organizer and someone in power on one of the largest waterfronts in New York City. The Brooklyn waterfront has been under control of the mafia for years, and it really goes back to the 20s and 30s. In fact, one of the first and longest tenured union leaders and overseers of the docks was actually a person called Anthony Anastasio. Now, that name may sound familiar. Yes, he is related to Albert Anastasia. This is one of the seven brothers of Albert Anastasia. Now, Anthony Anastasia doesn't get the same talk, but he, again, was extremely powerful. It was said that he would take control of the Brooklyn waterfront in the early 30s. And by the mid to late 50s, he was one of the more powerful people in the Gambino crime family. For Anthony Scotto, Upon heading back to the docks to take a job, he would become a recording secretary to Anthony Anastasia. And he realized, Scotto, that not only could he become the heir apparent, but he would become forever tied to the Anastasio name. Down the road, he would meet the daughter of Anthony Anastasio, Marion, and they would marry in 1957. Now, 57 was a good year. For not only Anthony Anastasio, but Anthony Scotto. Scotto, by this point, was essentially the heir apparent. Now, Anastasio had control of seven, seven ILA chapters. And at one point was the second in command 
to the national ILA. These were incredibly powerful people. And Scotto learned from the best. And he groomed himself to be the heir apparent to Anthony Anastasio. He then married into the family, which didn't hurt either. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Anthony Anastasio because he would die in 1963. But there have always been some very interesting things that were said about Anthony Anastasio. Not only um, was he a rich and powerful gangster, but he didn't have flattering things to say, not only about other gangsters, uh, but I think he saw the writing on the wall. It was said that in 1962, once his brother's killed, five years later, he still has certain sway over the docks um, because Carlo Gambino would still allow Anastasio to have control of the docks. But he started realizing that Maybe the mafia was going to kill him at some point. In 1962, it was said that Anastasio actually would cooperate with the FBI, giving information about not only Carlo Gambino, Vito Genovese, but also Tommy Aboli and Peter DeFeo. He believed Anastasio that the mafia was going to try to kill him. He didn't think it would be Carlo Gambino, but that the mafia would come after him. He would also be asked at one point, about his deceased brother, Albert Anastasia. Anastasia would, quote, say, I ate from the same table as Albert, and we came from the same womb. But I know he killed many men, and he deserved to die. So he didn't wax poetic on anything. He told it straight. The truth of the matter is, he is right. Albert Anastasia killed a lot of people. He was a menacing individual. And when you live by the sword, you generally die by the sword. Anthony Anastasio would die of a heart attack in 1963. Brooklyn's waterfront would halt all operations around that time. That shows you how powerful he was. But back to Anthony Scotto, his involvement with Anastasio and being the heir apparent would be quite important to him. Now, we don't have the exact date to when Scotto became a made member of the mafia, but it's likely to have happened between 1955 and 1957 before Albert Anastasia was killed and Carlo Gambino takes over and the books close. According to um, LCM Blogspot and certain different ceremony websites, they would actually say that Scotto would become a made member at the young age of 23. Now, that would elicit that he was probably made sometime in 1957 or even in 1956. But he was made and was very well thought of by the late 50s and into the early 60s. Who would think that by the mid-1980s, he'd be one of the most powerful labor racketeers in the mafia? Now, Anthony Scotto, uh, as I said, would become a made man and by the early 60s, um, he was one of the most powerful people as far as the ILA in America. At one point, according to a 1963 New York Times article, they would say essentially that um, he was um, one of the most powerful union people in America and that he held sway over um, almost 70,000 members of the ILA. In 1963, he would become second in command in the ILA. He was extremely powerful, and he was only 28 years old. They would talk about the fact in this article in the New York Times that he was a you know, guy that no one thought was a gangster. But again, in those times, the mob controlled everything. And when you were a part of things like the head of the ILA in New York City, essentially, you've got to get down and be associated with the mafia. Is he your traditional gangster? Do you put in work and run numbers and commit extortion? No. But there are certain people like Anthony Scotto that aren't normal gangsters. Are they gangsters on paper? Yes. And we'll get into how we know Anthony Scotto, Scotto was a gangster. But by the early 60s, he's in his late 20s. He's extremely powerful. He's extremely rich. He moves his wife and kids to a beautiful home in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. He's very powerful and very rich and holds a lot of sway. Now, in the 60s, Joseph Valachi would contend in his talks that Anthony Scotto was absolutely a member of the mafia. Now, Scotto would respond and say that it was a uh, Justice Department um, kind of uh, conspiracy to kind of hurt his good name. 
Now, I want to talk about Scotto. Look, we know he was a powerful ILA member and essentially ran the entire national chapter. But he was also incredibly powerful um, and connected to all sorts of politics and politicians. In the 60s and into the 70s, it was said that Anthony Scotto became a delegate delegate to the Democratic National Convention. His wife would also have a similar role. He was extremely close and would ultimately get Hugh Carey elected governor of New York in 1975. It was said by Scotto himself that he allegedly donated millions of dollars to Carey's political campaign. He was also extremely close to New York Governor Mario Cuomo. We know Cuomo had all sorts of mob connections, including Scotto. And according to Chris Colombo, he was very close to Joe Colombo as well. It was also said that Anthony Scotto had personalized letters from Robert Kennedy, which are a shock to many due to the fact that Robert Kennedy allegedly hated the mafia, but letters uh, were addressed to uh, Anthony Scotto where RFK sincerely signs them Bob, which contends that they probably had a very close political relationship. At one point in the late 70s, Jimmy Carter, who would become the president of the United States, would actually consider Anthony Scotto seen behind him as labor secretary at one point. Think about that. This is a sitting member of the mafia that was considered by a president to become a part of his cabinet. And by the late 70s, things would really fall apart for Anthony Scotto due to the fact that he'd be sweeped up in a 33-count racketeering indictment, which would ultimately not allow him to become labor secretary. But this is the problem that Scotto always had. He really didn't need to be a mobster, but he was just a creature of havoc and had to be a part of it. And it really hurt him in becoming even more powerful than he already was. Remember, Scotto knew everyone powerful in New York Democratic politics. He knew presidents. He knew Robert Kennedy. But his secret life connected to the mafia always showed through. In 1979, Anthony Scotto would be indicted on racketeering and bribery charges. And for him, he would have to explain to the federal government why he was attempting to bribe over a five-year period people that were involved with business and unions. He was accused of accepting $300,000 from two dockside businessmen who employed his union workers. It was also said that he would receive a swimming pool built by one of those businessmen at a vacation home that he owed. It was also said by the federal government that Escado was accused of evading federal income tax. In November of 1979, Scotto would have to face the facts that he would be going to prison. He would be convicted on all charges. It would be said that the judge in the case, Charles Stewart, would say that he was, quote, extremely impressed by letters from different New York City mayors, including John Lindsay, as well as labor leaders, all saying that they believed Scotto should have leniency. However, it wouldn't matter. In 1980, he would be hit with five years in prison. Scotter would report to the FCI Danbury in Connecticut. He would ultimately do 39 months and be released in 1984. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Anthony Scotto's kind of proof that he was absolutely involved with the mafia. And look, was he very rich, powerful, and a leader? Sure. But the mob thought highly of him as well. According to a wiretap involving Paul Castellano, he would be speaking to his driver and powerful racketeer in his own right, Tommy Bellotti, as well as Carla Gambino's son, Tommy Gambino. At one point, Castellano would say when it came to uh, Scotto, quote, we respect him. It was our union. We were making him advance in our union. Go up, go up, go up go up the ladder. And what's going to happen? We're going to have a president. So what does he say there? He admits, this has been our union forever. And we have handpicked this man, Anthony Scotto, to be our guy. 
he's second command, but we don't want him just to be VP of the ILA nationally. We want him to completely own this union. And everyone has their job in this family. And the boss of that family, the boss of all bosses, Paul Castellano, recognized who absolutely Anthony Scotto was. Was he a good man in Brooklyn? Absolutely. Was he a family man? Absolutely. But the truth of the matter is, Anthony Scotto was never able to get away from his underworld connections. And he gave away 40 or so months of his life due to that. And we'll also talk about down the road as an old man, Anthony Scotto was still very much involved and connected to the mafia. Now, upon John Gotti taking over the family in 1985, it was said um, that he would actually demote, or not demote, but Scotto was old at this point. He would actually um, take him back to um, kind of soldier. It was said that throughout the life of um, Scotto that he was a captain in the Gambino family. We don't know much about who was in his crew, but it was said that he almost um, kind of brought up uh, Sonny Saccone, who would ultimately take over his a post and job on the docks. And Sonny Saccone was John Gotti's guy. And it was probably agreed upon that, you know, I'm sure Scott received money still, but he wasn't the kind of guy that he had been over the last 20 years. But remember, he held sway nationally in the ILA for over 20 years. Now, what also Scott became was a very rich man. He had a trendy condo at 350 East 72nd Street on the Upper East Side. He had a vacation home in the Hamptons. He had a restaurant downtown that was run by his kids called Fresco by Scotto. It is still around today and still run by the Scotto family. Now, once we would get into the 90s, Anthony Scotto uh, would become essentially retired from pretty much everything. Down the road, he would actually, quite interestingly, still talk about labor. He would actually at one point lecture at Harvard University and would become trustees at local colleges. However, his connections to the mafia would still be there. In 1999, when Jimmy Brown failure would pass away, guess who showed up at his funeral? Anthony Scotto. Regular people don't show up at those funerals, really maybe as revelers or something, but they don't show up as guests. They don't shake hands with other people. The problem also is that wiretaps would also contend that Scotto was still regularly in contact with mobsters, including Sonny Saccone. Now, I want to talk about a very interesting conversation between Anthony uh, Chacon and a person called Anthony Tato Anastasio. This is the son or sorry, the father-in-law, someone essentially connected to Anthony Anastasio that was now on the docks with Saccone. He would have a conversation with Saccone about Anthony Scotto. This Tato Anastasio, who is related to the original Anthony Anastasio, was essentially complaining to Saccone that Scotto wanted his $280 a month pension. And why was he not getting it? And that he was, quote, entitled to it, which we don't disagree with that. Now, Saccone, in a very funny tone in the wiretap, would say to Tato Anastasio in regards to his cousin, uh, Scotto, he would say, quote, Chacon, he's a legitimate guy. I told him, forget about it. What the fuck is it with you? $280? You don't have enough fucking money? I mean, you need this fucking $280 that fucking bad? Come on, Jesus Christ, all fucking mighty. So Saccone is telling Anastasio that does Scotto really need the $280 a month when he lives in one of the trendiest buildings on the Upper East Side, has a home in the Hamptons? Does he really need the $280 a month? But again, this is the old guy for you. Anthony Scotto was an elderly guy by this point, but principles are principles. He wants that $280 a month. But again, what it further shows us is he still has contact with members of the mafia. Is he making decisions? Of course not. But once a gangster, always a gangster. And I just found that story funny that with all the money Scotto had, he still wanted that $280 a month pension from the ILA. Uh, Now, Scotto had uh, four children, including his daughter. 
Rosanna Scotto, who, if you live in the New York area, you've seen many mornings. She is an anchor and host on Fox 5. And from what I understand, is a co-host currently on Good Day New York. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the son of Anthony Scotto, John Scotto, who does not have a good name in the underworld. In fact, he is a rat. Uh, I want to talk about John Scotto, the son. Uh, at one point, he was a New York restaurant tour, but John Scotto would make his way out to the city of Angels, L.A. And I want to talk about a situation that John Scotto would find himself in in the late 90s, or in fact, the late 80s. According to LAPD, in 1988-1989, John Scotto was busted for extortion. He was attempting to extort two L.A. businessmen out of a nightclub. John Scotto, between the years of 1993 and 1996, according to court papers, was an active police informant for the LIPD Organized Crime Unit. Now, in court papers, I want to talk about some of the messages that we would hear about, including one sent to Michael Gervais, an LAPD organized crime detective. In one tape-recorded message, John Scotta would leave a message on the detective's answer machine telling him to, quote, Hi, Mike, it's John. I know you called me. In a second phone call, Scotta would leave the same phone number with his message saying, quote, I've got some information. I wanted to get this to you the other day. We met tonight. So if you get this message within the hour, please call me. Now, Gervais, the detective, would cite hundreds of pages of documents followed by the LAPD that arrested Scotto for extortion in 1989 and that he became a police informant around the time he would be arrested for extortion. Now, it was said that John Scotto would help to convict multiple criminals, including Israeli criminal figures in L.A. Now, John Scotto ultimately had to go to prison and had to do some time, but he was a police informant. It was common knowledge that for about three years he had a relationship. Now, John Scotto at one point was a disbarred attorney. Uh, but, you know, he no longer was an attorney and decided to start extorting people uh, and to get out of it uh, and to limit uh, the time that he had to do. He was an informant. He would ultimately serve about 14 months in prison. When it comes to Anthony Scotto, we don't talk much about his longstanding ability to become one of the most powerful labor racketeers and politically connected gangsters of all time. Again, look at this photo. He is essentially right near Jimmy Carter. And at one point was thought to be a labor secretary candidate on the cabinet of a sitting president. That's connection. Was he Frank Costello? I'm not ready to say that, but he's not far off. Anthony Scotto was a pioneer in labor racketeering ultimately built a very nice life for he, his wife, and his kids. But his son, like him, followed him into the criminal element and had to face the same fact of the streets will always get you in the end. Anthony Scotto didn't need the mafia, but it was just something that he had to be a part of. He was a creature of havoc, and if he came up in the 70s, maybe it would have been different, or maybe not. In the end, though, was he connected? Sure. But his late conversations in his life made it clear he was a gangster, too. Anthony Scotto was an interesting guy. He would die in 2021 at the age of 87. I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.